Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Storytelling Resilience, Narrating Home with Newcomer Communities. My name is Miriam Zaidi, and I am the Communications and National Network Coordinator here at Girls Action Foundation. In a couple of minutes, I will be passing the mic to Hawa Mire. We are very fortunate to have her with us today. I am happy to see some familiar names joining us for today's webinar. For those returning, welcome back. Uh, for, those who, who, for those of you who are new to our webinar series, I wanted to briefly introduce you to the Girls Action Foundation before passing things along to Hawa. So very quickly, uh, Girls Action Foundation is a national nonprofit that believes in the power of girls as agents of social change. Through our network of organizations across Canada, we lead, develop, and implement transformative programs that are adapted and relevant to the changing realities of girls' and young women's lives. We also provide leadership trainings on a national scale, organize networking events, and do other activities that connect girls and young women. Girls Action has four national working groups to engage those with similar realities in their programs for girls or young women. Working group participants have the opportunity to exchange ideas on specific issues, share resources and tools, and discuss promising practices. Today's webinar was, it was initiated by the working groups for programmers working with newcomer and racialized girls and young women. The project is funded by the Canadian Women's Foundation. So just before I pass the mic to Hawa, I'd like to walk you through the interactive side of today's webinar. You'll see on your screen a number of different information displays and panels that will be changing throughout the presentation. Um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a panel titled Q&A. Here is where you can ask questions and interact with myself and other participants, as well as Hawa. If you have a question or comment during the presentation, type it in the Q&A box, hit enter, and it will be recorded there. By default, the question will be visible to everyone. If you would prefer to submit your question privately, click on the down arrow at the bottom of the Q&A box and select Girls Action instead of All Participants, and the question will then come only to me. At the end of Howa's presentation, we will be answering questions from the Q&A box, so feel free to ask your questions as they come, and Howa will answer them at the end of her presentation. Throughout the presentation, um, oh, I, Sorry, I wanted to let you know that today's webinar is being recorded, including the question period. So this will be posted online and we'll send everyone a link to the recording. Finally, at the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up. Uh, please fill it out. We'd love to read your feedback. So um, Hawa Miri is a diasporic Somali storyteller, writer, and strategist who focuses on themes of blackness and indigeneity, disconnection, and unbelonging. Her writing is seated somewhere between oral tradition and the written word, celestial and myth, past and present, ancestry and spirit. An MES candidate in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University, her research incorporates traditional Somali stories with discourses of constructed identity while pulling from archival histories of resistance and radical curatorial practices. How as the curator of Ensoroma, an organization that incubates, supports, and amplifies insurgent black art and artists. Her writing can be found at Jalada Africa, The Feminist Wire, Rabble, Arawilo Abroad, and more recently she has co-edited a special issue for the Canadian Council for Policy Alternatives, Our Schools, Ourselves, titled Constellations of Black Radical Imagining, Black Arts and Popular Education, due out spring 2015. Um, her, short, uh, her short story series, Black Woman, Everybody's Healer, was, was long listed in 2015 for the Jalada African Literature Prize and is currently in the process of being written as a book-length ma manuscript. With that covered, I'd like to now pass the ball to Hawa. Hi everyone, um, this is the first time I've tried to run a workshop over a webinar, so bear with me. Um, there's a chat box, um, I'm gonna be answering questions later, but if something comes up as I'm talking that's relevant to the conversation, please feel free to toss it in there and I'll do my best to get to it. Um, so I'm currently based out of Toronto, the traditional lands of the Mississauga of New Credit, 
Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. In providing this acknowledgement, I'm really clear that I'm positioning my work in a broader collective call for the ongoing destruction and, and active dismantling of a white supremacist, settler colonial, imperialist, patriarchal, and capitalist society. And I say all of this also to position, uh, sorry, I say all of this and I really want to position the work that's happening in Toronto right now with Black Lives Matter, um, which just as early as yesterday, peaceful protesters were met with a really high level of police aggression to say that um, we talk about storytelling always in the context, I talk about storytelling always in the context of the work being done by various communities to resist. Um, and so I start, as I always have in my writing and in my work, for myself, my stories, my family, and the people around me who have helped shape the person that I am. If you look at the front of my, um, the first slide of my presentation, you'll see the top my, uh, picture of myself and the top two photographs are actually images of me when I was a very small child. And then the bottom two are images of my grandmother who I was named for, which I'll get back to a little bit later. Um, my family fled Somalia at the beginnings of civil war about 26 years ago. Somalia has a rich history of oral poetry. For those of you who might not know, um, it's on the east, for the east coast of um, the continent. So entire histories were passed, are passed in Somali culture from elder to child in the form of rhythmic storytelling. And my mother used to tell me and my other siblings stories all the time, um, folk tales, stories about animals, stories that were fantastical as much as they were very real. And they were always focused on her experiences of displacement, home, and ancestry. And in, in all of this, in hearing these stories coming to a relatively new place, um, I was always trying to make sense of who I was in between spaces. And I say all of this, again, to say that stories um, are not just kind of a fluff word I'm throwing around as we, as we walk through today's um, webinar, but really an integral part of the way I work. Um, and for me, and a critical part to the way we bridge between communities. So I'm going to really try and make as much of today as concrete as possible um, for all of you. So Sandra Cisneros, for those of you who may, who may know, who may not know, is a really incredible writer. And one of the quotes that she has that I continuously come back to in terms of storytelling is, we tell a story to survive a memory. Um, and we forget that very often the stories we share around our own experiences are really around how we heal and how we continue to be resilient in spite of. Um, and there are ways in which we can capture particular memories that help us feel grounded or help us feel like we know who we are even for those brief moments of time. Um, so there's a bit of an agenda as well. I'm going to go through, for me, a little bit around what is stories share some tips and techniques. And really the bulk of the session, I'm hoping folks have brought some creative utensils, things to use. Um, I want to walk you through an exercise around where are our stories and ask you to maybe excavate some of your own stories, which if we have time, I'd love for people to just kind of share some of the things that came up. And if we don't, feel free to reach out to me individually or feel free to share, the, share what you've done today with other folks in your lives. Um, and then I'd like to end by sharing a story around my grandmother. Um, and then open it up for a Q&A. So, Dan Okri, uh, really well-known African writer, says, we live by stories. We also live in them. One way or another, we are living with stories planted in us early or along the way. Or we are also living the stories we planted knowingly or unknowingly in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate it with meaninglessness. If we change the stories we live by, quite possibly we change our lives. So in this is a real seed that storytelling also has the potential to shift and move the ways in which we imagine ourselves. So it's not just a site um, of memory and recollection, it's also a site of futurity. Story is often believed um, to be in the world of the irrational, imagine, imaginative, and fiction, while history as its counterpart is known as the realm the rational, the reasonable, and the intellectual. Thomas King tells us that oral history testimony was often seen as unreliable and at odds with a more authentic written account. The world that we live in, this Western world, often operates on the idea that orality or oral language or storytelling is only useful as long as it proves something that's been written. 
But for those of us who come from places where telling stories is history making, um, storytelling is a way of transferring knowledge and, uh, and a knowing in the ways that we see the world differently. So this webinar is about opening space for those of us who come from places where stories are frequent and consistent and help us retain a sense of self and identity. I'll share some of my own stories um, after I walk you through a short activity, which I hope will be useful in excavating some of your own stories. As we think about stories and storytelling, it's important to distinguish between a few things. One, anybody who knows me will tell you, um, I deeply believe that our entire world is made up of stories, everything is story. From the short joke you tell a friend, the gossip that passes between your family members, and that old folk tale that explains where water comes from. We have a story in the Somali culture that talks about how the, uh, the fox got its tongue, which might seem kind of meaningless and not important, but it's a story around morality. It's a story around returning that which is into yours. Um, and these are the small kinds of things that I grew up with around me. Um, even when we remember, even in the beginning when I shared um, a little bit about what was happening with Black Lives Matter Toronto and how um, they're being met kind of with aggression from the police, that in itself is a story, and it's one that's being changed and moved differently depending on which spaces you go to. Some folks will say peaceful protesters, some folks will say aggressive protesters. So all of these things build narrative arcs in the world that we live in. So when we're thinking through story, remember that everything we do is story, the way we live is story, all of our experiences are story. And when we talk about ourselves, when we talk about the stories that we want to share, I think we always have to start with ourselves. We always have to start thinking through how we position ourselves in relation to the things that then come from us. Um, and in that, ask ourselves some really interesting questions. What stories do we tell about who we are? What are the stories we remember? What are the stories we don't remember? Um, what are the stories we create to fill in the gaps? What does it mean to be you? What does it mean to potentially, or very, in a very real way, to be free? What does it mean to challenge old stories even while you're making brand new ones? What does it mean to define your own identity? And then to think through what stories do you tell the most frequently, even when, um, even when you don't notice it, when someone says, hi, I'm whatever, Tell me about yourself. What are the things you go to that are your kind of easy answer responses that you've learned to believe about yourself along the way? Um, what stories are critical for people to really understand you and really know you in a deep and intimate way? And what stories have you been entirely unable to tell? And so I say all of these things because it's really difficult to even hear other people's stories until we know what ours are, until we know what we listen for and how we listen for it, what's interesting to us and what isn't. I grew up in a family of people where humor was very, um, was very, was rewarded very often. So I listened for jokes, I listened for humor all the time because that's just the context that I come from. So I'm more likely to hear a story that has a great punchline than I am to hear a story that might not necessarily, that might be more subtle in nature. So again, where we sit and where we position ourselves um, is based on our own experiences, but where we also begin to hear other people's stories also comes from that place as well. Um, oh, and before I go there, um, I also I want to say too that stories contain both resilience and trauma, and trauma um, that we've encountered, that we've dealt with, maybe that we don't even know necessarily exists, but still kind of resides in our bodies and in our memories. And um, lots of that trauma around people in our families. And so I remind folks, as, as you look for stories, as I say, ask, you, ask yourself these questions, but also um, don't rip off the band-aid and dive into some of these pieces. Storytelling and excavating your own experiences and stories sometimes takes some time to think through what the consequences of that excavation might be, and if you're ready to necessarily step into those places, but to rip off and dive in might not always be the best course of action for you, depending on where you are in your particular context. Um, when we talk about tips and techniques, I spend a lot of time working with young people, uh, most recently a lot of young African women, which is really incredible and really great, um, and we talk a lot about what makes the stories we tell from the continent so particular and so different than the stories we often hear. 
And the way to think through all of the tips and techniques that I share may be useful for you and may not be useful for you, but the way that I'd like you to envision it is to think through when you, what is, what's the story somebody has told you that has really made you feel something? Happiness, joy, anger, disruption. Like what are the things, what are the ways in which people share? For me, immediately I think about uh, my aunts and my cousins sitting around a space and just laughing and um, giggling over some new piece of gossip somebody's recently heard and just the, the bravado and the, um, I think, when, you know when your aunt walks in, she's just kind of like, hey, I just heard this thing. And you immediately get sucked into the drama and pettiness of it, even if you don't want to. For me, when I think of a great story, I think about, I can't even help but be moved into the story. I can't even help but be the person who is like, okay, what happened? Who is it about? Tell me more. Even when I don't particularly know the people or care at that moment, it's just it's the way that she's telling me the story that keeps me so enthralled in the experience. And so um, some of the tips and techniques look at, so set, set, in, set a particular kind of environment, so where, who, and why. Um, not everyone knows the context through which we're speaking. We like to believe sometimes that we're incredibly, um, that our stories are incredibly normal and that we share a small piece and people are like, what are you talking about? because they don't understand the back history um, or the back story of your experience. So really set a particular kind of environment. Um, the second is tone, so the way and the speed in which you share the stories completely changes the narrative. Um, use pauses, stop, think through what you're about to say, wait for people to respond, watch other people's body cues if you're speaking the story. Um, and I've seen brilliant work done around visual storytelling where people will just use blank space to take up, just take up blank space, um, leaving readers having to kind of flip through pages to understand what, where people are going, um, and repetition. Uh, if you repeat a single line or a few phrases throughout the piece, it, it does something to draw the person listening or reading back in a few times. Think through how much of yourself is actually involved. Um, how much of, your, of what you've shared is honest and a little bit nerve-wracking. If you're feeling a little bit like you've got butterflies in your stomach just before you share something, that's a good kind of nervousness, right? If your hands are absolutely clammy and your first response is get out, get out, get out, maybe that's not a story you're necessarily ready to share. When we're stepping out into the world showing people um, something or sharing with people something that we're not necessarily ready for those are babies or and you know you don't we don't pick up babies and leave them to fend by themselves on an empty couch you know we've got to kind of coax them to life and give them room and breath to move and share them with the people that we know will take care of them um, suspense is the fourth one so build your story up really think about the critical pieces that are involved um, and as a rule of thumb, use your five senses, right? What did things smell like? What did they feel like? Uh, and we often think of feeling as emotive, which is one way to think of feeling, and also think of um, touch, think of texture, think of if you were to reach out and touch something, what would it feel like? What would it feel like coming against your face, against your cheek? What would it feel like if it were to rub against your legs? Like, think about the, the actual texture of your feelings as well as well as taste, as well as sound, and as well as visual aids that we often rely on. And finally, it's your experience. So no one can share stories in the way that you can. No one. There's no one who lives in a body that looks like yours. Um, other people have similarities. There, there are ways in which we can link into similar experiences around us. Um, but your experience and your life and your stories are so unique to you that um, once you develop a way of sharing, no one can quite mimic or take that on um, without making it seem a little bit hollow or a little bit different from the person that you are. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a breath, take a moment here. I'm going to ask folks at this point in time to grab some kind of visual aid, pen, paper, um, markers, crayons, whatever it is that you've got with you. And if you haven't, don't have any of those things with you, treat this as a bit of a visualization exercise. Um, and I'm going to work us through this particular exercise.
And again, if you have questions, if I'm moving too fast, which sometimes I can do, um, feel free to drop something in the box below and I will revisit or re-explain. Okay, so the metaphor of a tree is such a beautiful one. You can use kind of trees to explain everything as much as possible. As you can use oceans and seas and waterways. Um, nature has a really incredible way of reminding us uh, of linking to really it's the things that seem relatively intangible because it's present and it's also a very tangible thing. Uh, and this activity is called Where Are Your Stories? And so the first piece, um, number one, is called where is, is labeled, where do you grow? And when I ask folks, where do you grow, I, I'm asking you to think about where across time and space, if all those constraints didn't exist, do you grow? What are the places you imagine yourself stretching out um, and expanding? If you could plant the perfect tree somewhere, knowing that you would return again and again to this place, where would it be? This is this place, this is the place. Where do you grow is an is a is a place of dreaming and a place of visioning, of imagining yourself in your best place. So I'm going to ask folks in answering to grab your creative materials and to think through where do you grow? Where would you place this tree if you could place it anywhere? And I, I had someone a, a few months ago um, put it back 30 years and say, this is actually, I want this place that 30 years ago, this place is where I wanted to put this tree. And so you're not restrained by parameters of time and space and location. You can put it anywhere. You can design what that place looks like. The second question is, what is rooted? And I ask that, or what I ask in asking that is, where do you choose to land? So using your creative materials to describe the place you've chosen to land to grow yourself. And why? Why are you rooted there? What is the reason this is the place that you've chosen to stay? What about it makes you feel connected? What about it makes you feel like you've arrived and can remain? And what does that rooted look like? Sometimes our ideas of things that root aren't necessarily things that stretch deep into the ground, but a collection of tiny rhizomes in various locations that lead to a particular tree that you've chosen to stay at. What does rooted look like? What is rooted? The third one um, is what fruit do you bear? So what do you choose to make? What comes out of your tree? Where do you choose to invest yourself that can keep in a place that keeps you constantly overflowing. And remember, the way to think about fruit is as something that's both a gift to yourself and to others, the people that you choose to share it with. Even those of us who just stand and watch you benefit from the fruit that you bear, right? Even those of us who are observing benefit from the fruit that you bear. So what do you choose to make? What fruit do you bear? And finally, number four is, and where do you seed? The fruits carry seeds. This is really a question about legacy. In leaving behind pieces of the gifts that you've offered, for others to find and perhaps regrow from or reroot from, what do you leave behind? What do you leave of yourself? What do you hope to leave of yourself? 
where do you seat? So I'm going to say too that I know these PowerPoints are going to be available. So. Um, and that this, the audio recording will be available after the fact. So take an opportunity to come back to it. These are questions that, um, that I like to think of as many, the beginnings of multiple mini stories. Um, each response as you respond is tied to a different experience for you and a different context that's relevant and important for you, um, past, future, present. And each of these pieces are intimately yours. And it doesn't matter who you write them with, um, you'll always see yourself reflect. It doesn't matter who you share, what other people have shared with you about what they've written, um, your pieces will always have these really intimate stories about yourself and about your own experiences. So I really encourage people to, to write through them and, or to draw through them or to create through them and see, see where these places, see where these questions take you. Okay, so I'm going to just go back to the very first slide that we started with um, and talk a little bit more about these images. Um, one of the things that I try and do is if I ask you to dig, if I ask people to dig a little bit into their own stories, um, one of the things I try and reciprocate with is some of my own stories. So you'll see. Um, the two pictures on the right-hand side, the top two pictures, are both me when I was a young child. I think the first one I must have been about 18 months, and the second one I'm about three. And the first one I have a little stuffed camel um, animal toy, and in the second one I'm biting into a green tomato. And so my look of happiness, probably shock, is the sourness of the tomato that I've bitten into. And the two images, at the bottom, um, the one on the furthest bottom right is my grandmother when she's in her late 20s, and her name is Hala, and I was named for her. Um, and the second image is um, when she's in her early 70s, maybe about four years, five or six years ago. And this is one of the last pictures taken of her before she passed away. And the important part, the importance of these images for me is that I was not only was I named for my grandmother, but my grandmother, um, both my mother and my grandmother were large sites of storytelling for me. My grandmother in particular would tell me stories that um, I constantly revisit in the telling of um, the stories that I tell now. And so she's become very integral, integral, integral sorry, uh, to my storytelling journey. And so I want to read, um, a story to all of you, but I seem to have lost it. Um, I want to read a story to all of you about home and homecoming that I think you might enjoy. So this is titled Obliteration. When he traveled back to Somalia, he changed hotels with every fall of shadow, afraid that the cousins he played with would gun him down in the street. Every coffee shop he sat inside reading newspapers in familiar languages, he never visited more than once. Twice was too many times to tempt the fate of bombs. He missed death too many times to count, but its face appeared in his barber's mirror, the friend who pressed upon him the extra food, the ruffling of dust in an empty street. He tells me that all the guards he had ever met were mercenaries, killing those they could for money or pride, and sometimes shame. He tells me that he cannot imagine anything more different than the place he fled from with children on his back. He looks up from his tea, bites the dripping beads from his speckled beard, and wonders out loud, if Somalia is no longer home, and this place is the in-between, what is left for me? He is three days before 50, a lifetime of shallow plateaus, rickety seas, and meticulously frayed two-piece fabric. When I ask him where home is, he whistles through his teeth, high enough for its melody to hit the roof of my tongue, 
as well as his, before rippling through the tiny bit of cup tea he hasn't been able to finish. He smiles then and tells me, home lives inside my heart. I walk around with a gaping black hole the size of an atom, catching the things no one else seems to want to carry. Home doesn't have a place anymore. And if it ever did, my heartache is stronger than gravity's pull. So you see, I wouldn't want it now. It is filled with trigger holes, broken necks and promises, graves deep enough that the souls have begun to seep into the water people drink from the wells. Graves filled with the shark teeth I used to fashion into necklaces and the chafed legs of my own grandmother who was desperate enough to drink the water so she wouldn't lose her only son. So do you miss it? I ask. Home? He leans towards me and whispers into my face, loudly and with a faint mist of milky breath. Do you? So in sharing all of that, I realized that I might have, um, I moved really quickly. Because um, when I don't have physical people, it's hard to run through an activity and give it time for people to walk through. So I'm going to actually open it up now for questions and answers. Um, and if you have a question, if you have something you'd like to share, feel free to drop it into the box just on the bottom right-hand side. So again, for those of you who might have joined in um, and taking questions and answers, um, feel free to drop a question into the box on the bottom right-hand side. We have a question from um, Dahara, who asks, I was wondering, what is the place of truth in marrying home when newcomer communities tend to idealize? Um, I think that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, lots of my ideas around um, narrating home are kind of these mythical um, places that I've never been to, uh, in the same way when I um, try it down and have conversations with family members, they tend to think of Somalia as this, they tend to think of Somalia in very clear ways, which is like pre-trauma, pre-war, um, and remember it fondly and remember it in really beautiful kinds of ways. And I think I'm, I think I'm really interested in this, um, I'm really interested in the ideas of the story, of the stories we share around home that allow us to continue to be resilient. It's not always um, part of building resilience at first to share the things that make us feel good and great and secure about home because we don't always feel like we can um, connect to places that are so important to our own um, identities from a place that isn't even a little bit similar to the places we're from. So I think it's truth is subjective and that's why I talked about story and history is that um, in history is subjective, although people tend to always see it as something that's subjective. And story doesn't necessarily have to be focused on this idea of achieving truth. It could also just be focused on this idea of achieving um, 
what is truth for now, what is what is real for people in a particular moment, what an experience um, is for somebody in a particular moment. So I think how I would answer that question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. Um, the second question um, from Betty Dobson is, what do you see as the best way to elicit stories from people? What encourages them to talk? One of the things that I spoke about um, in in the in the slide, one of the the fourth slide, I just put it up now, is that I think we have to start from ourselves when we talk about stories and we talk about this idea of soliciting stories, particularly for those of us who are working with newcomer communities. Um, one of the best, I wouldn't say easiest ways, but one of the most useful tools in building trust is um, learning where where you situate yourself in relation to other people's stories and also learning when it's appropriate and when it's not to share um, pieces of your own experience. And I don't necessarily, I know as a youth worker it can sometimes get a little bit tricky, um, but people also need to know that your experience, need to know that you're being real and honest and truthful about where you're coming from in order to be able to trust you with some of their own experiences as to where they're coming from. Um, and story is kind of a loose category can um, be a really beautiful way to do that. You don't necessarily have to start from um, yourself. You can start with this broader idea of stories and start with, um, as a youth worker, one of the things I always talked about were things that happened to me on the bus on my way into work, um, things that I liked, things that I didn't like, and what I was able to inevitably do with these kind of mini stories with young people is, um, talk about my experiences, like why why would it make me uncomfortable to have somebody come sit right next to me on the bus when there's 10 other seats on the bus that are available? Um, and then we could talk about space and we could talk about, um, you know, I didn't grow up with people. I, did, I grew up with a large family, but we had rules. Our, we had rules about who, how close people could be to one another um, depending on context. So, um, yeah, and I agree, Betty, it's, it's such an, it's an ongoing struggle, but I really do believe that if we start from ourselves and really start to excavate our own stories, that is what encourages other people to want to reciprocate. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've shared a deeply personal story about myself and had people come and share the same back to me. So we have the level of vulnerability that we exhibit is the level of vulnerability that people are going to reciprocate with, which I hope answers your, your question. Um, again, I open it up to folks to drop something into the question box if they have any other questions. Um, Kendi asks, when working with newcomer communities as a newcomer that has been in Canada for a long time and came when young, I find it hard at times to relate my stories to other newcomers because after being here for so long, there seems to be some disconnect, um, especially when so, yeah, so I came to Canada when I was quite young. Um, my family had, um, sorry, especially when the newcomers some, somewhat find the time difference. So, yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. Again, I came to Canada when I was quite young. My family um, came to Canada in the late 80s. Um, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself a newcomer at all anymore. Um, but I will say my family still, lots of the things that have happened or have brought me to where I am now are, are, as, a, are as a result of having um, a very particular kind of newcomer refugee experience. Um, and then I have this kind of bizarre, uh, re, and I have this bizarre interaction where I grew up in areas with predominantly um, newcomer communities, um, of which, of whom were my family members, some in, especially in Toronto. And now the bulk of my work is working with mostly newcomer Somali youth um, and Somali youth whose parents have been here for some time. So, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know what else I can offer except that because I'm a youth worker, the needs of the communities that I'm working with always seem to be really relevant. Um, people are using social media in a way that's just. Um, uncanny and actually incredibly brilliant. I use Twitter a lot. You'll hear me say this over and over again. Um, I love Twitter. I think it's fantastic. 
Um, and if you want to tap into young people now, if you want to have a sense of what it's like for young people, especially newcomer folks coming in, like tap into social media and get a sense of what people are saying because people are talking and are sharing experiences and are trying to build community and are trying to connect with what's happening back home more and more frequently. Um, but I think also in, in the same question some, someone asked earlier around truth, the trick isn't to find out what the, what the, what the baseline experience is for all newcomer communities but as, a, as a singular truth, but to explore it as divergent and very diverse kinds of realities for people living um, here, young people coming as newcomers here, which is going to differ depending on how they came, when they came, who they came with, what supports they have, what's available for them. So again, I really encourage folks to think through um, think through the diversity of experiences of people coming and ask, you know, what what are things you need support with? What um, this has been my experience? Has this been yours? Like these are the kinds of conversations we could be having um, in a very real way. My experience now is not going to be the same as a young Somali youth who has only recently arrived. Right? These are two entirely different. Um, experiences, though we can work to find similarities between between both. But these are these are incredibly incredibly brilliant questions. Um, is there anybody else who has a question? Feel free to throw it into the question and answer box on the bottom right hand side. Um, there's a question from Nike, sorry if I mispronounced that, who asks, how do second generation, um, how do second generations marry at home when it hasn't been a lived experience but the experience of absent ancestors? Um, yeah, I mean, this is an incredibly tough one. I've never been to Somalia. Um, I've never been to the places where my family members grew up, and yet I invoke it a lot as kind of this mythic place. Um, when I when I write stories, I've been to East Africa, but have yet to be anywhere in the Somali territories. And I mean, this is a struggle. This is this is what I'm. So I have a lot of interest in work people are doing around this idea of futurity and this idea of, um, of creating ideas of home. And um, there's again, this is a very tricky kind of a tricky line because you don't want to talk about home in ways that seem authoritative and, and very um, and very objective and as truth-telling, especially when there are still people living in those places that folks have left um, and facing very kind of real consequences and very real, um, and facing very real ramifications um, and political decisions that you don't necessarily have to experience. And I think it's important to remember that you have every right to talk about a place that's home, so long as you're talking about it again from from yourself, from um, from your own position where where you sit. And I think in doing that, you have to talk about a place that you consider home and talk about the context of the place that you're currently living at the same time. Um, and I mean, I, the way that I, I'm not second generation, I, I came here when I was very young, as I said earlier, and, but the way that I invoke a place that I've 
that I don't remember being to is I talk a lot. I talk a lot to the elders of my community. I I constantly ask people questions about, um, you know, and I'm pretty sure at this point my dad is entirely irritated with me. I'll ask really, I'll ask questions about um, the senses. I'll ask things all the time about what did it feel like, what did it taste like, um, what's the sound you remember when you woke up. Tell me about. Um, the way this person um, would tell a story, tell me about, I used to ask my grandmother very often how her mother would tell her stories, not the stories she'd tell, but like what would she do just before she told the story, how would you know she was telling you the story, um, because I'm trying to kind of invoke the ancestry of my great-grandmother who I never had a chance to meet in a place that I, I don't remember being, and I think there's something very powerful and in asking people to remember those experiences and then if not trying to piece together from people who are who are living um, and then what if you don't have people who are living I think these are the kinds of um, small traumas that we live with that we have to resign ourselves to is this is this is the impact when I talk about when I position my work initially in um, in my colonialism in the legacy of this kind of violence this is this, these are the reasons we're unable to connect to people and places that um, we have deep rooted connection to is because there are processes outside of our control that have made it difficult. Um, and if you're lucky and other people have produced work, I do a lot of reading. Um, I read a lot of work by Somali fiction writers, just trying to see what they use and how they talk about a place that I haven't been. Um, but you know, these are the kinds of traumas I think we live with as people who aren't um, from a place um, and have come from another place is that um, these are the systems that have made it possible, uh, that have forced us out of places into other places. And we may not necessarily recover all that's been lost to us. And I think I know for me that's actually, that's quite a sad realization. But thank you for that question. So again, if there are any other question and answers or questions, sorry, um, drop it down into the the box on the bottom right. And as we mentioned before, this PowerPoint, um, this entire uh, webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to come back to it another point in time. Okay, and so um, I'm still going to take questions if folks have them, but I want to let folks know again, um, feel free to get in touch with me if you have further questions around stories and storytelling. Um, my work, um, especially my research work right now for my master's is really focused on this idea of storytelling and orality as a way in which we can resist and as a way in which we can build resilience. Um, I'm looking primarily at the Somali community, but I think there are lessons that are transferable across class community, um, particularly for newcomer communities. I think one of the, the greatest sadnesses is that folks come um, and have and feel a desire and a need and a survive as a survival tool as well to catch up and to pick up language cues and to to know the system. And one of the things I really want to reaffirm too is. Um, it's important to also know what you bring with you. Those are all strengths, and those are all very, um, very critical pieces to where you stand and how you ground yourself. And um, I think just as much a tool of survival as are all the other more practical logistical tools. Um, I, lots of my stories have pieces of them that are in Somali, and I think there's a way in which the languages we bring with us really reinforce. Um, our sense of self and our sense of identity, um, and using them even in ways that don't always, um, that aren't always appreciated, can be a really powerful tool to continue to resist and be resilient. So feel free um, to get in touch with me by email, by Twitter, um, on my website, and um, I'd love to hear how. Um, I know when I pass it over to Miriam, that will um, she'll send out uh, Growth Action Foundation will send out an evaluation as well. Um, but I really love to hear how that activity went for folks and what came up for them and if there's pieces that they're still going to explore as part of their own storytelling. Feel free to take the activity if you'd like to use it um, and use it with the folks in the communities that you're working with. And I'd also be curious to know how it worked and how it went there as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over, pass the ball over to Miriam.
Great. Um, thank you so much, Hawa, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for those um, really enriching questions. Um, so uh, that's all the time we have for the presentation today. Um, for those uh, of you who would like to share this webinar with others, a link to the full presentation and uh, the Q&A period will be available online in the next few days. And I'll be sending you a link um, directly on where to find it. Uh, we would also, uh, as Howard mentioned, uh, we would also like to ask for your feedback on today's presentation. So once you leave this webinar, a window will appear with a very short survey. Uh, we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. Uh, this is a way to help us continue to improve the webinar experience for uh, participants. So if you'd like to find out more on this topic, um, check out uh, the Girls Action publications in our online resource center on our website, um, and you can find uh, publications such as Decolonizing Social Justice or Our Community, Our Words, um, so two zines um, that uh, involve storytelling. Um, also, you can visit our website um, and view past webinars on the webinars page. Uh, you can also like our Facebook page, um, our Twitter, um, and all the other social media are available on our website. Um, if you uh, want to find out more about our coming, upcoming webinars or if you have any uh, questions regarding this webinar, you can email me at miriam at girlsactionfoundation.ca. So again, thank you for attending and thank you for being with us today. Um, and um, a special thanks for filling out our survey. Have a great day, everyone.